thank you very much for the uh, invitation to be here and the honor of being part of this conference. <clears throat> I'm going to go over three different cases of GI infections. And this one is a infection in someone who's immunocompetent. So this would be an infection that any of us could get. It's an 18-year-old college student who had two days of watery diarrhea. Then associated with this was pain that was very severe and in the right side of her abdomen. And on the third day, when the diarrhea became bloody, she presented to the emergency room. On examination, she had a, a low-grade fever. Her blood pressure was normal at 110 over 70. She was very uncomfortable and her abdomen was very tender, but it was not with rebound. It was not a surgical abdomen and she did not have any skin rash. Her laboratory values showed that her hematocrit was normal. She had no evidence of anemia. Her white blood cell count was a little bit elevated with an increase in polymorphonuclear cells suggesting an infection and her platelet count was normal as well. Her electrolytes showed that her sodium was normal, her potassium was a little bit low, her uh, renal function was normal with a BUN of 20 and a creatinine of 1.0. A CT scan was done in the United States. It's pretty much standard to get a CT scan in the emergency room with anyone with abdominal pain. And perhaps that's not the best approach, but it's what actually happens now. And you can see that there's significant colon wall thickening in her colon. Is there a pointer? Okay. So you can see here very marked colon wall thickening in her, in her colon with a normal small bowel. The initial treatment in the emergency room and on the ward was to send stool for cultures and to give her IV fluids. She was also given broad spectrum antibiotics and a sigmoidoscopy showed a very uh, mild but definite colitis. And biopsies showed what looks like a little pseudomembrane here and an almost ischemic appearance here to the mucosa. The crypt architecture is normal but here's a little pseudomembrane that arises, but this also has a picture very similar to what you might see with ischemia. The stool culture results showed that she did not have the usual enteric infections. She did not have Campylobacter or Salmonella or Shigella, but she did have E. coli 0157H7, which has now been uh, renamed as Shigatoxin E. coli. This is an organism which emerged in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, sometime between 1980 and 1982. And there were very well publicized epidemics in Toronto and uh, an epidemic with McDonald's hamburgers. I come from Washington State and we had a very famous epidemic associated with Jack in the Box hamburgers in 1993, where 700 people uh, were ill with diarrhea from this pathogen associated with the small hamburgers and four died, all of whom uh, were children. It looks, however, as though this serotype probably did evolve over millions of years. When the shigatoxin culture came back, the antibiotics were discontinued. She had a gradual decrease in her diarrhea. But after the third day in the hospital, she developed a petechial rash on her arms and her legs and on her trunk, similar to what you might see here. Also of note was that her renal function began to deteriorate. Her creatinine was 3.2. Her platelet count dropped from normal to 60,000. Her hematocrit also dropped to 30. And her bilirubin rose. And you can see with the bilirubin was 3, but with the direct being 1.0, that most of this rise in the bilirubin was associated with indirect bilirubin and not direct. So at this point, the diagnosis is hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is a thrombotic microangiopathy. And Shigella toxin E. coli is the most common cause of HUS in the United States. Before Shiga toxin uh, E. coli emerged, Shigella was a common cause as well. And these two organisms are very similar. <clears throat> 
This organism also causes thrombocytopenic, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So the triad for hemolytic uremic syndrome is thrombocytopenia, a non-immune hemolytic anemia, and acute renal failure, and this young woman had all three of these. There are two types of hemolytic uremic syndrome, the typical and the atypical. And the typical form is like this case that I'm telling you about now, most commonly associated with an infectious diarrhea. However, about 10% of cases of hemolytic uremic syndrome are not associated with infection. And these then are called atypical. And we don't really know what the trigger is for those cases. So with uh, infection, such as shigatoxin E. coli, the incidence of HUS is about 5 to 15 percent. But young children are at the highest risk, and they're also at a much higher risk of dying with an overall mortality of about 12 percent. And if they recover from this infection, which most do, about 25 percent will have long-term renal dysfunction and chronic kidney disease some of whom become dependent on dialysis. Why does this happen? The sugar toxin damages the endothelium and causes an angiopathy. The bacteria in the gut produce this toxin. The toxin then translocates to the systemic circulation. And the first case report of shigatoxin E. coli with hemolytic uremic syndrome was in 1983, shortly after the shigatoxin uh, E. coli was identified. So typically, uh, you can see hemolysis on a red blood cell smear. Here's normal, and then here are the schistocytes that you see typical of hemolysis. And pathologically, the kidney becomes damaged because of these microvascular thrombi in the kidney. And the uh, decrease in platelet count, we're not exactly sure why that occurs. It's thought that perhaps the platelets adhere to the blood vessels and become trapped in that way. In our patient, the colitis resolved. She had worsening renal failure and required hemodialysis for several weeks, but gradually improved. And on long-term follow-up, does have chronic kidney disease, but is not on dialysis. So just to step back, I wanted to review the different types of E. coli. I, um, I think a good way to separate out the E. coli are those that involve the small bowel and those that involve the colon. So the ones that involve the small bowel are enterotoxigenic E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, enteroadherent E. coli, and diffusely adherent E. coli. And the one that we're all aware of is enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is the one that causes traveler's diarrhea when we travel to other countries um, and uh, ingest contaminated food. It's the most common cause of traveler's diarrhea. Usually starts at about uh, three days after you uh, go to a country where you're not, <clears throat> where you don't live normally, but a high-risk country, and is usually a very brief illness with diarrhea, vomiting, and fever. Now we don't have diagnostic tests for these o E. coli, so this is a matter of being uh, able to recognize this clinically. But there really are no diagnostic tests for enterotoxigenic E. coli that are available outside of a research lab. In terms of being a gastroenterologist, I think you can forget about the other diarrheas. Uh, they are, uh, again, no diagnostic tests. They would be important if you're doing research, especially if you're uh, a pediatric gastroenterologist doing epidemiology research. But for those of us who practice in a day-to-day -day setting, it's not really important to know. But just to share the information, the enteropathogenic E. coli cause neonatal diarrhea or nosocomial diarrhea in children. Enteroadherent E. coli is a cause for diarrhea in children in developing countries. And diffusely adherent E. coli is another cause of traveler's diarrhea. Now, in contrast, the two E. coli that involve the colon are enteroinvasive E. coli, which causes a dysentery, and enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which also causes a dysentery. And this is the shigatoxin E. coli. I think the terminology is very confusing because we're calling it shigatoxin E. coli, but it's actually not 
the, the enterotoxigenic, that's the small bowel pathogen, it's actually enterohemorrhagic. So I do think that the uh, people who make up these classifications are somewhat, uh, are, are not the most uh, easy to understand. So the rates of hemolytic uremic syndrome and thrombocytopenic uh, purpura are about 2%, 2 to 8% in adults and about 10% in children under the age of 11 with overall fatality rates of about 3 to 5%. Some of the studies done in Washington State as a result of the jack-in-the-box epidemic showed that children who got either antidiarrheals or antibiotics were more likely to die or have severe disease than the children who didn't. And they were able to separate out that it wasn't just that they were the sicker children and that that's why they got the antidiarrheals and the antibiotics, but they're more likely to induce hemolytic uremic syndrome. We don't know for sure why this happens. We're not sure exactly that it does happen, but these observations are strong enough from these epidemiologic studies to suggest that with hemolytic uremic syndrome, you should not use antibiotics and you should not use antidiarrheals. For most travelers' diarrhea, antidiarrheals and antibiotics are very safe. So how do we put this into practice? I think in practice in a child, it's probably best to avoid antidiarrheals and antibiotics until you're sure that they don't have the shigatoxin E. coli. The incubation period on average is about three to four days, and as in our patient, there's initially a watery diarrhea that is associated often with severe cramps. The abdominal pain has been described as being, like, by women, as being like childbirth, or by men as being like a kidney stone, so a very severe abdominal pain. And this is very different than most infectious diarrhea, where there may be crampy abdominal pain, but it's not severe. There may be a fever, or the fever may be absent, and in the United States, it's the fifth most common cause of infectious diarrhea in, when stool cultures are done. And typically, it involves the right colon, where you can see with the biopsy and with the clinical presentation, it can mimic ischemic colitis. In fact, some people think that cases of ischemic colitis in the past may have been due to the shigatoxin E. coli. Ingestion of contaminated food or, and water is the most common cause, and the most well-publicized epidemics are associated with hamburger meat, where the uh, meat from several different cows is combined to make the hamburger, and the contamination occurs sometime, somewhere between the uh, feedlot and the, uh, and the restaurant. However, anything that can be contaminated by, by cattle um, excrement can be contaminated with E. coli 0157. The Odwalla apple juice epidemic was due to them using apples from the ground that had fallen from the trees that were contaminated by, uh, by uh, cattle manure. And the famous epidemic in Japan of sprouts, raw sprouts, many of which were in children's lunch boxes, were felt to be due to contamination of the sprouts in the field where there was a cattle field next to where the sprouts were being grown. However, if you're taking care of a child with shigatoxin E. coli and you don't wash your hands, you can get it from a child, for, so there can be person-to-person -person transmission, and contaminated swimming water can also, has also been shown. So hamburger is the most uh, common vehicle, but raw fruits and vegetables can be uh, vehicles as well. It doesn't take very many organisms to make you sick. You can get sick from ingesting as few as 10 bugs. We know this from the jack-in-the-box epidemic because it was the small hamburgers that were contaminated. So those were, uh, so, so they, and they had about 200 organisms per hamburger before they were cooked. So probably all of those organisms didn't survive. They were mostly eaten by children, and those of you who are parents know that most children never finish their hamburgers. So they could find out there was really a small number of organisms that it took to make people sick. And about 10% of the cases were from uh, family members becoming sick by their, uh, from their children. As gastroenterologists, we need to know about this infection because we often will be the first person to see such a patient in an older patient, they may look like they have ischemic bowel disease or inflammatory bowel disease. And leafy green vegetables have been the source of many, many epidemics in the last 20 years.
Testing for shigatoxin E. coli requires a special stool culture medium, a, um, and uh, antigen tests, which are not always available. And in the United States, the, the uh, Center for Disease Control recommends testing the stool both with stool culture and with antigen tests. Now, the most famous shigatoxin E. coli is the O157H7, but there are many other numbers of E. coli, and they may account for about 20 to 50 percent of shigatoxin infections. And they also can cause a spectrum anywhere from watery diarrhea to colitis to hemolytic uremic syndromes. And most labs do not test for these organisms, so we do need better tests in order to recognize these strains. But the most famous one recently was the outbreak in Germany last year, and this was associated with serotype 0104H4. Uh, and this was a huge epidemic you probably read about in the newspaper, where almost 4,000 patients were affected. And um, most of them were very ill. And the attack rate for hemolytic uremic syndrome was 22%. So 845 people developed hemolytic uremic syndrome and 54 people died. So it's really the most uh, striking outbreak of this uh, in comparison to others that have been documented. Also, most of the hemolytic uremic syndrome cases were in adults. Usually we see this more in children. Only 2% were in uh, children under the age of 2. Genomic sequencing showed that this organism is actually a hybrid of an enteroaggregative E. coli and a shigatoxin E. coli. It had a longer incubation period of eight days, and that's probably why it was able to spread so widely before people realized what was happening. And it had these very high rates of EHUS, and the vehicle, again, was raw sprouts. So you're trying to eat healthy by eat, eating raw vegetables, and they can sometimes make you sick. So it's suspected that this uh, E. coli, that the shigatoxin E. coli acquired this uh, strain from a prophage with this uh, gene. And what happens in the gut is the decaying bacteria release the shigatoxin, which goes from the gut to the blood to the kidney and can also go to the brain. In this epidemic, 217 patients were documented to have neurologic symptoms of 217 patients who were studied, half of them had neurologic symptoms, and often these started five days after the diarrhea or even after the hemolytic uremic syndrome. And in this study of the neurologic symptoms, two-thirds had cognitive impairment or aphasia, 20% had epilepsy, and when, in those who had an MR study of the brain, it was abnormal, and when they recovered, the brain actually normalized. And the neurologic symptoms seem to be in parallel with the rise in the BUN and in the creatinine. What about in South America? Do you have shigatoxin E. coli? Has anyone here seen a case uh, in Colombia? You're scratching your head or raising your head? I think you're scratching your head. So you haven't seen any cases. This was a, a recent paper in Peru, in Lima, where they looked at stool cultures from children with bloody diarrhea who are under the age of five, and they did find shigatoxin E. coli in 9.2%, and one clinical clue there was often that the fever was absent. So if your laboratory doesn't use the McConkie sorbitol agar medium, you will be missing this diagnosis, and that was certainly the case in the United States uh, for many, many years. When labs weren't looking for it, they didn't find it. So treatment is supportive. We should avoid antibiotics and avoid antidiarrheals because they may increase the likelihood of HUS. However, the study in Germany does suggest that maybe antibiotics are safe. Now, azithromycin is often recommended for traveler's diarrhea, but not for shigatoxin E. coli. But many of the patients in this study actually did get antibiotics, and it did seem to decrease the carriage rate of the organism. They didn't seem to have a worse course. So I think we need to relook again at the safety issue of the antibiotics and whether they might actually shorten the illness and not increase the risks of HUS. But these studies have not yet been done. So in summary, shigatoxin E. coli is the most common cause of hemolytic uremic syndrome. We recommend supportive therapy. A small number of patients will develop a chronic kidney disease as a sequela. Thank you very much for your attention.